Hello, good morning, and welcome to The Coding Train with me, your host, Daniel Schiffman. <laughs> I always feel so ridiculous doing this. Um, I, you, you may have noticed that I wasn't around last week live streaming. Um, that was because I was sick. I had another uh, lovely case of laryngitis, but things seem to have come back. I'm able to speak. I'm going to try to limit myself to just a couple hours today, which is really how much I should limit myself to always, but sometimes things tend to spiral out of control and I'll suddenly have live streamed for four hours wondering why. But I will be back tomorrow. So today, whatever I do today, will be um, in two parts. So part one today and part one two <laughs> tomorrow. So first let me thank today's sponsor, um, <coughs> Dashlane. Uh, Dashlane is a password manager. I could not live without uh, password management. <laughs> um, and it's something that you, uh, if you don't use a password manager, you might consider checking out Dashlane. And you can go to dashlane.com slash coding train to get a free 30 days of Dashlane premium and also a discount if you choose to purchase it. So I'll come back um, and talk a little bit more about Dashlane later. Um, but I wanted to thank them right from the outset uh, for helping make it possible what I do here on this YouTube channel. Huh, I also want to talk about something near and dear and close to my heart. So let me, um, whoops, uh, <laughs> no, that doesn't matter. Let me open up a web browser. By the way, this is a new computer. Uh, and so I have not done anything really to set up this new computer. Uh, um, I mean, I set up my own personal login to this computer with my dev environment, but then I this morning just created a coding train login and I've not set up the dev environment. So that's something I will actually do during today's live stream, which will either thrill you um, for uh, it, because you'll get to see some of these you know, a bit of the behind the scenes. It shouldn't be behind the scenes. It should be right out in the front of the scenes. But it's a little bit of, uh, you know, you might be wondering like, well, what are the Visual Studio Code extensions you have installed and that kind of stuff? So I'm going to uh, go through that because I have to. Can't do anything without having gone through that. <laughs> and then, um, so that's one thing. Oh, but where I was, I was talking about, um, I want to talk about the Processing Foundation. Um, so a few things about the Processing Foundation. So if you're not familiar with the Processing Foundation, Processing Foundation is a U.S. non-for-profit 501c3 tax-exempt uh, organization. We are a, a charity based in New York State, <laughs> if you're wondering about all the legal <laughs> jargon. Uh, processing is the entity that maintains the software, software tools. Uh, processing, P5.js, processing.py, or Python version of processing, processing for Android. And then there's also, it's very confusing, processing for Pi, which is the Raspberry Pi uh, implementation of processing. So all of these different tools, maybe you use them, maybe you teach with them, maybe you've just ex been exposed to them because you watch them on the coding train. White balance looks good on green screen. Maybe the focus is, oh, sorry, I shy. This is, it, it appears that if I cannot, I cannot keep my focus, which might actually be true. But what happens is I'm on a little thought and then I see out of the corner of my eye a message that seems important. I start to read it and then I lose track of what I'm talking about and here we are. Um, let me double check the focus. Uh, today I will be um, <coughs> advertising <laughs> the mud coffee. Let's put that here and see if I can focus on this coffee because that seems like I might be um, out of focus a little bit. Then I'll come back and talk about the Processing Foundation. Oh yeah, it does seem a little out of focus. It's more out of focus. 
Let's see. Let's see. Is that better? Maybe that is better. Tell me, everyone, if the focus seems a little better on me now. Hopefully it does. <coughs> and I'll have a sip of my Bud Coffee. It is not a password manager. <laughs> Cannot manage your passwords. But it will keep you awake. I've been having a lot of trouble sleeping. I think I, have to, I, think I really need a no screens policy after 8 p.m. I've got a little bit of a Pokemon Go problem. Should I not? Should I admit that or no? <laughs> What's happened? What's happened to me? <coughs> processing Foundation. So I have been part of the processing project as a contributor or enthusiastic user of the of processing since around 2003 uh, when I learned about the project from some workshops that others had taught at ITP where I am currently. Um, and over the years I've been, you know, with each year that passes I've gotten more, a little bit more involved. Maybe these days I get less involved, I don't know where the, what the exact trajectory is. But um, without the Processing Foundation and all of, and, and countless hours of volunteer work um, and some paid work that's been generously funded through donors and other types of initiatives, um, none of what I do on this channel would be possible. So um, recently, um, there is a new, uh, one, of the, one of the tools that I use probably the most these days um, is um, P5.js library. So I'm going to the Processing Foundation Medium page, which I probably could have got to from, <laughs> from here. There we go. I might have gone to the wrong place there. Um, oh, th this is what I wanted to look at, but I want to look at these two. So first of all, if you're wondering what's the latest stuff going on with the Processing Foundation, you should check out the, um, the, the articles that are on Medium. And the first one I want to highlight for you is this uh, article written by Lauren McCarthy, the creator and uh, leader, <laughs> lead developer of uh, the P5.js project. Um, and I won't um, read the whole article for you, but you can kind of uh, get the idea here. No, no, I don't need to sign in. Um, you can kind of get the idea here from the title, Making Space for the Future of P5.js. So after seven years of developing and leading the project, um, Lauren is planning to uh, transition out of her role as project lead in January 2020. And we are hoping to have a rotating model of leadership with a new leader every year, and this would be a paid position. Um, so this is something we are currently act at. <laughs> Um, this is something that we are um, currently actively fundraising for because this is something that is a question of can this project even continue? How do you sustain a o open source, uh, a healthy, inclusive open source project? And this is a constant struggle and there are no easy answers and I'm sure lots of projects run up into all the same questions and issues. Lots of people are working and thinking about this. I encourage you to read this entire article uh, written by Lauren McCarthy. And if you want to, if you have the means and can, you know, so part of the reason why it's an open, free open source library is some of you watching this maybe cannot support the project financially. And that's totally fine. That's great. That's what it's here for. But if you can, or you know somebody who can, or there's a way that you can contribute or advocate for it in some capacity, I would encourage you to donate. And so I want to draw your attention to this other uh, article by Dorothy Santos, who is the project uh, manager of the process, uh, sorry, program manager of the Processing Foundation. Um, and, um, um, and we are running a fundraiser, uh, like a month, I don't, all the information is in this article written by Dorothy. You will notice something here that might look familiar to you. I don't know, maybe you've seen Mara Rose, and this sort of like little booklet or zine. This looks like something that you might have seen on the coding train. It's because um, as part of the fundraiser, there are, uh, okay, no, I don't need to be interrupted. There are rewards. Uh, rewards from, um, this is a work by the artist uh, Maya Mann. Um, th these are Rizo prints that you can get as part of your donation. Um, Kate Hollenbach, and I'm going to scroll down and find Saskia uh, Frecke. She's told me how to pronounce her name. <laughs> I'm not I'm drawing a little bit of a blank right now, but I think it's for these. I love, I love all of these, but I, I have an affinity to these kinds of geometric patterns that are created with processing and P5.js and other. Um, but Sai, who is uh, the Coding Train Community Manager, who um, many of you may have come across in your communications with uh, 
things around this channel, um, has been working very hard on a coding train zine. So as of now, this is exclusive to uh, donations to the Processing Foundation. You know, I will share all the code and all the images in here are part of things that have been on the channel. So, uh, um, but um, if you are interested, this is something that I am working on producing and could be part of a reward with a donation. I will also be doing my annual processing <coughs> fun live stream fundraiser. Holiday fundraiser, oh, this is out of tune, while playing my ukulele and making a fool of myself singing holiday songs with coding themed lyrics. <laughs> uh, I will be doing that next week, probably a week from today. That's the date I'm targeting. I haven't uh, scheduled it yet, but it'll be next Thursday or Friday or Wednesday. <laughs> yeah, I can't do it after the 20th. I'll be away. So that's my uh, plan. So actually, speaking of which, um, I need a, maybe, um, I don't know if Violet is watching. Uh, Violet has been working on helping to maintain a lot of the community contributions and GitHub repos associated with the coding train. They are doing, they're being so, it's, I'm, I'm so grateful for their help with this. Um, and if I go to github.com slash coding train, I'm trying to think like where, where, where can you submit? Did I do like, um, let's see, holiday, I feel like there was a repo last year for this. I'm having trouble remembering. Let's look. Oh wait, I can type in here, holiday. Holiday songs, okay, we could just use this still. <laughs> so I had a book of like holiday ukulele songs which were the songs that I had chords for that I could play. Um, I saw a YouTube tutorial about how to play last, is it called Last Christmas? Is that the song? I don't know about this Christmas thing. I never, I, I was not somebody who celebrated Christmas as a child. You can make your inferences as to what sort of winter themed holidays that I, my family celebrated. Hanukkah, I don't know why I'm dancing around the Hanukkah bush. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Uh, <clears throat> but, um, uh, but I love, I have a, a love for holiday music, and as embarrassing as that might be. And so if you have some uh, songs you want to write the lyrics for, provide me ukulele chords for, or a backing track, I will play a back MP3 backing track <laughs> even, uh, you can submit that to this uh, repo, please. I encourage you. Contribute to my time of making a fool of myself um, next week. Okay, <clears throat> now, so I've talked about the Processing Foundation. I have talked, I've thanked Dashlane. Um, ah, one other thing I want to mention. Let's go to, there's there might be other things I want to mention, but in my uh, update on what's happening in the world of the coding trade. Oh, two things I want to mention. Uh, so I, one thing that I did recently, hmm, am I going to be able to find this? Uh, Wait, no, okay. I'm looking for, ah, uh, here we go. Um, so um, I recently had, was lucky enough to have my uh, Beginner's Guide to Machine Learning uh, playlist converted to a YouTube learning playlist. This is a new feature. I don't know if it's out of beta or still in beta, but this is a new feature within the last, I can't remember when this launched, but sometime in the last year, um, which is allows for a little bit of extra organization of video content on YouTube in, uh, um, with more of like a syllabus style, if you will, um, organization. So um, you, I just want to like, a lot of, there's nothing, there's not, well, there, there's some pretty new content here because um, I, some of these videos just came out within the last week. But what this is, well, whoops, we'll um, is uh, all, I've basically collected all of the videos where I'm using the ML5.js library, including my sort of introduction to the library, the image classification videos, the transfer learning videos. This is a little bit of an aside, but it's useful. The Canon classification videos, the teachable machine videos, the train your own neural network videos, which is what I'm actually continuing today. They'll go in a new section, probably called uh, pose, poses, working with poses, I don't know what they're called. And then I, I have a few different videos which touch on audio, so they're here. So, you know, if you are looking to sort of find and go through somewhat sequentially all of the uh, JavaScript machine learning videos I have, they're here. Now, that's to say it's not actually all of the JavaScript machine learning videos I have because there are a ton of them. 
if you, whoops, um, no, ah, no, go, come back. Who am I logged in as? I don't even know what's going on. Sleeping, tw ooh. Can you hear that? You cannot. Hold on, everybody. We're gonna have a little like random number ASMR. <laughs> no, no, we're not, we're not. I, I, I gotta keep moving here. <laughs> I'll come back to that later. Um, Great channel here, by the way, Everyday AI. You should check out Everyday AI. Um, what am I looking for? My home, my channel. I don't know what's going on. Your channel. What am I logged in as? No, I'm a, oh, I'm somebody else with no channel. <laughs> I have too many Google logins. It's such a problem. Um, this is my Daniel at thecodingtrain.com login, which you'd think would be the owner of my channel. It's not. Someday I'll figure that out. Dark theme is on uh, YouTube. <laughs> Uh, this is a login I only use for logging in during my live stream, so who knows what I'm subscribed to or what it's recommending. But how, how, why do I not see the sidebar? Oh wait, I do this. There we go. Oh, oh no, I've saved this, I guess. <laughs> oh no, this is what I'm looking for. <laughs> oh, this is the worst. What I was saying is I have a lot of other videos on neural networks and machine learning, but, um, um, thank you, David. Um, I will mention that. Um, there's a lot of other videos on machine learning that are a bit lower level and deal with a little bit in Python, but mostly like programming a neural network from scratch and some other background math and that sort of thing. So, uh, okay. By the way, this spring, I don't know how you, I'm, let me just take your temperature on this. I'm not going to do a poll. I'm not going to do anything scientific here. But I am thinking of redoing this entire series, which was recorded, um, let's see, let's look at one of these like vector videos. So first of all, look how different I look. I mean, do you see any gray hair? Where's those stripes in the beard? They're gone. So this was recorded quite some time ago. It was published on YouTube in 2015, but I think I even recorded these before that. So it's 2020, five years later. I am thinking of redoing all of these videos. Um, in JavaScript along with writing, uh, updating the Nature of Code book. So if, if that's something that would excite you, let me know. <laughs> um, Everyday AI, K. Weekman, that is correct. Um, and again, if I, I, I apologize for this. For those of you in the member Slack channel, if you could remove the previews, I can see very little of the history of the conversation, and I can see none of it as soon as there's like a big unfolding preview of something. Um, okay. So there were other things mentioned. There's the wheel. There's the community contributions. Um, I think those are other things. So let me mention the wheel. Where uh, Actually, before I mention the wheel, David, maybe you could point out where I should go. Where's the best place for the discussion on that? Um, and let me go to the community contributions. So I know uh, Simon always points out the videos that I never showed any of the community <laughs> contributions on. Uh, at this point, I'm probably not going to get to ones that are a big backlog unless there's something uh, that I particularly want to highlight. But I will um, at least show you the community contributions on the most recent coding challenge, which was released uh, yesterday or two days ago, um, um, where I created, I implemented the Minimax algorithm to uh, have a uh, um, to play the game tic-tac-toe. So let's go to this. First of all, let's go to the live demo where I will now attempt. To beat this player, this computer AI mini max player, I will get you a tic-tac-toe. Ooh, by the way, you could like do some kind of cool gesture tic-tac-toe game. Haha. -ha. See that move? Watch this. Now I'm going to go here. <laughs> here. You cannot get me. Okay, gotcha. Oh, oh, so sad. So sad. All right. <clears throat> Coding train GitHub page. It's the most recent repo created. So that was the challenge. Uh, the X's are being played by the Minimax algorithm. If you're wondering what that is, there's a 30 minute video for you to watch. <laughs> and then there have already been, wow. I have not been, I did not look at this this morning. There are one, two, three, four, five, well, eh, two of them are from Simon. So five unique people contributions already. Um, 
There's Tic-Tac-Toe Minimax in Python with alpha beta pruning. Alpha beta pruning is not something I implemented as part of the challenge. I alluded to it. Um, you know, I, I assume that this is not something that I can easily run here, but um, I would encourage you to check out um, there's um, uh, David Snyder's example of this in Python. It's nice. This is wonderful. Anytime you're creating something, if it's not something that just runs in the browser natively, making a little GIF and including that as part of README is a wonderful thing to do. Um, thank you for that. I'm um, going backwards for whatever reason. Uh, reverse I. Ooh. Oh. Ho, ho, ho. Seriously? Wow. This is reverse I Minimax with alpha beta, beta pruning by Copper France. All right, everybody. Ready for me to show my reverse eye skills? Ah, I always stretch before I play reverse eye. Is it reverse eye or reverse C? Reverse C? Le reverse I don't know. Uh, am, I, am I going first? What are these little dots? They, I, I, don't, I haven't played this game in a very long time. Oh, OK. Whoa. I guess I'm black. Is it giving me clues of where to go? Or those are the only places I can go. Oh, those are the only places I can go. By the way, I'm not thinking at all about what I'm doing, so please. OK. I don't think I'm going to win this. Bad feeling. Oh, the, I remember. I haven't played this in years. The, the goal sort of is to get the corners, right? Reverse C, I'm being told. Oh, Kobe says their contribution is still waiting to be approved. So, Kobe, I can maybe uh, uh, pull it up anyway. All right, all right. <laughs> this is incredible. I'm going to play this on my own time later. Uh, thank you, Copper France, for this. I'm very curious to take a look at your code. Um, oh, I've got to do something about my... Um, look at this. Ah, wow. So this is actually... It looks quite similar. looks like the whole game has been uh, implemented here. Uh, amazing. Okay. Let's keep going and go to... Okay, so Simon, I know, because Simon made his own video about this. Um, where he made a chess AI. I'm just going to go. So, so one of the things about the uh, Minimax algorithm is with tic-tac-toe, I always looked into the tree of possible outcomes all the way to the end of the game. But there are some games, I mentioned this in the video, that are so complex, you couldn't e computationally visit every single possible move that could come from, the, from now to the end of the game. So. With something like chess, you have to decide, well, whatever your heuristic is, whatever your estimated way of computing the sort of score of the game at any given time, how far down, how many moves ahead do you want to look? So I, this second one from Simon has a customizable little search depth, but let's just look at the first one. And one thing I'm curious about, Simon, is did you implement your own version of chess, or did you use like an existing chess library? Uh-oh. Louis Marshall, I am very sorry. <laughs> uh, je suis désolé. My French is terrible, and I shouldn't have done that. Uh, I'm trying to pronounce reverse C in French. It's probably not even a French origin game. Okay. Um, I'm curious, did you implement your own version of chess, or did you find like an implementation of chess in JavaScript and then just add the Minimax algorithm to it? So we can see here that I assume if I do something like this and move my pawn, and then uh, move my other thingy. <laughs> You can see my chess expertise. I'm going to lose. I'm definitely going to lose. This is wild. Amazing to see. Thank you, Simon. I encourage you to play this. I'm sure some of you who are uh, uh, sophisticated chess players will easily beat this AI, but it is interesting to think about how, how, how good at playing the game can Minimax be with chess. Um, let's go to uh, Tic-Tac-Toe with Alpha Beta Pruning. So this looks very much like, whoops, this is very similar to uh, my game. Um, and if we look at the code, whoops, source code, what I'm curious to see is it really easy to see um, where the alpha, yeah, so you can see here uh, in with the, um, the function, uh, has four, uh, uh, in addition to the depth, has additional arguments alpha and beta, which are keeping track of what the score is and allowing um, the algorithm to skip down certain paths down the tree, knowing that there couldn't possibly be a better outcome there. 
So Simon is saying that uh, he used chess.js for the chess engine and chessboard.js for the visualizer. That's great. So I wonder if that's something that I could actually tackle. It's not realistic, I think, for me to, for me to program my own chess engine, not without like a very long multi-part series. But um, certainly, um, <coughs> Certainly doing something like what Simon did could be uh, possible. All right, let's see if we can find Kobe's um, contribution. Oh, it's already added. Connect four, ha <laughs> ha, wow. So Kobe looks like uh, uh, he added uh, Minimax Connect four and Minimax Connect four with alpha beta pruning. Once again, I'm just gonna go to the regular Connect four. This is something that I was actually hoping to do I'm going to move here. Oops. Oops. Ack. Um, it's a little bit slow there. That's not where I meant to go. Let's go here. Do not, do not want to give them. Oh, weird. Not what I expected. Ah. No, no, bad. Mm. <laughs> ah! <laughs> I shouldn't go there. That's a bad move. All right, all right, all right. You get the idea. Everybody, you all had better ideas of what moves you do. This is great. Thank you, Kobe, for this. This is pretty amazing that even just that basic algorithm. Um, I well, I um. The normal version is really slow, showing the alpha beta pruning use. So this would be, so I guess from, I'm gathering from Kobe that, um, that Connect4 is a good example of there are so many more possibilities than tic-tac-toe that having the alpha beta pruning really improves the speed. So I, that would be something that's worth me doing a follow-up perhaps about. Yeah, I can, it feels much more responsive and quick now. Of course, I, I think I just lost. <laughs> so thank you. All right. Uh, and then, um, so thank you for those community contributions. Please continue to make them. If you don't uh, know how to add one, um, 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 there's some instructions and, and, and information here. Just file a GitHub issue asking for help. Um, I will say that um, don't be intimidated by the amazingness and sophistication of these. I want your community contributions, even if all you did is change the colors of what I made to make it your own beautiful, like rainbow-themed uh, tic-tac-toe. Like I, I want to see everything that you do. Don't worry about um, getting things wrong or it's not cool enough. No, it's all wonderful in my eyes um, that you're watching these videos and making stuff. And in particular, something that some of you as who are maybe um, have an affinity for uh, visual design or interface design, you know, you might, uh, I would welcome uh, versions that clean up how the interaction is and change the way the game looks visually. Um, those are exciting and wonderful to see. Okay. So last uh, update before I start actually doing some stuff here. <laughs> I always go to, this is, by the way, I, all, I think it's so funny uh, that I always just type github.com slash website. I think that's going to get me somewhere. Coding train. I don't, know, I don't know where I'm going. I'm just typing github.com slash website. Uh, coding train. If I go to repositories, um, it is the most recent topics wheel. So let's see. Um, so um, David Snyder, I guess there's not a lot here right now, but um, Big Boots asks, sorry, let me come back to just answer this question. Big Boots asks, hi, Big Boots. I wear small boots. Um, does it have to be P5 to contribute? Absolutely not. I think the, the whole reason for having the contributions is for people to bring to it something that they are excited to share. And that might be, ah, I made a version of this in a different programming language. That's wonderful. Um, the advantage of P5 is yours can be run easily in the browser. But if yours doesn't run in the browser, um, link to a video or a GIF or some other kind of documentation if you can so it's easy to take a look. Um, 
Darshan is asking me something about the community contribution for the regression challenge, but it didn't work for an audio context problem. Hmm. Ah, oh, you mean it didn't work last time, but now it does work. Sure, Darshan, thank you for your contribution. I will take a look at that. Where, uh, where do I, the regression channel, the regression video? Uh, and, um, Ah, regression based on node frequency and color predictor. Okay. I don't know what to do. <laughs> so something to think about <laughs> is to uh, think about what, the, well, maybe I'm just going to figure it out. Oh, this is very similar to my uh, C, C, C. Ah, this is just like my example. So of course I know what to do. Oh, and I get to like just draw stuff around. That's so much better. Let's train it. So I know, um, oh, I guess this still, <laughs> what happened this time? I'm not seeing it work. I don't see a loss function. I tried, Darshan, I tried. <clears throat> Do we still have the, the audio context problems? I'm sorry. Please, everybody, check this out. I'm sure I'm just completely incompetent and not getting to this work correctly. But one thing I will say, so one thing that I think is something for all of you to think about when you create interactive work to put on the web is you have to think about what context people are coming to it from. Now, I know what keys to press here <laughs> because this is based on the challenge. And in fact, that's, this is great. This is being shared as a variation off of that example. And if presumably someone is checking out has watched the video. And so, but something you could think about in terms of always having on the page some instructions or uh, user test it with somebody, a friend, before you post it, and that type of thing could always help. Um, at least four classes. Ha! OK. We'll try this one more time. C, D, E, F. I've got four. Train. All right, we've got a loss, people. We've got a loss. OK. All right, I think it's trained. Do I, am I supposed to hear something? Oh, it's the color. Oh, that is so cool. Oh, I see. It's not sound. It's color. That is beautiful. Look, and I can paint now. I love this. So I feel like the letters are kind of getting in the way of my experience with this because I love the fact that it's now this basically gradient over. And did you do a regression with three different outputs? You must have. Uh, this is beautiful. I think there's so much potential to this. I'm sorry that it took me so long to figure it out. Um, and so I would think about maybe what you might consider doing is Instead of having the user uh, um, um, type in these letters, which is, I realize what I did in my example, but maybe there's a way there could be a color picker here, and I could paint certain colors, and then I could train the model and then paint over the space based on those colors. Oh, there's so many possibilities in image processing and filtering and interactive art. This is wonderful. Thank you for sharing this. Thank you for uh, <laughs> insisting that I get it right. Um, I really uh, enjoyed, I really, I really think this is wonderful. Um, uh, great work. If you, make, if you update it or make any changes to it, please let me know. Um, thank you, Darshan. <laughs> Bell for Darshan, okay. Um, <clears throat> and let me know if I've mispronounced your name. Um, by the way, can I just say something? If I ever, 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 ever get anyone's pronouns wrong, please reach out to me and let me know. I make an effort to be thoughtful about how I refer to people on the channel, but I'm sure I make mistakes. Um, and uh, I want you to reach out to me um, and correct me and help me um, if at any point I mispronounce your name, get an incorrect pronoun, refer to you by the wrong name. Um, uh, please reach out to me um, any way that you know how to reach out to people on the internet. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> are we 
at 1040. We are. So I've got about an hour and 20 minutes left. I think what I'm going to do is uh, work on setting up the dev environment and then take a short break and start talking about and teaching you about PoseNet um, in the ML5 library and looking how, about how to use PoseNet with the neural network classifier. So, <coughs> can we do the ASMR random number reading now though? <laughs> The one thing I want to do, actually, because it, it could be necessary layers, I'm just going to go to, I, I should do this. Um, oh, no, no, no. This is weird thing with a Mac where you go to like audio MIDI setup, and then I create a multi-output device because I want to go to the speakers and Pro Capture. Pro Capture is what is the uh, capture card that's taking the signal from my laptop. So now I think if I were to go to... Um, See what sort of meditation YouTube wants to recommend to me today. Oh, how come you don't hear that? Oh, output. Multi-output device. Now you hear that. Okay. Okay, perfect. That was me testing the computer audio. My voice is still a little shot. Doing the best I can. I've got to really, I've got to get a lot of vocal rest if I'm going to do this holiday song fundraiser next week. Okay. <clears throat> so let's see what, I, I honestly, like I don't even know what's going on in this computer. Um, let me open up iTerm. So, ah, okay. Uh, iTerm is the uh, terminal application that I like to use. One setting that I really, really, really feel that I need, I think it's under, it's the one that like when you resize the font, it doesn't resize the window. Does anybody know where that one is? Uh, I also like to use reuse previous sessions directory. Uh, I should really make a video about all these settings. Um, not that mine are any good. Um, appearance, uh, are we, where is this one? Advanced? No. Profiles? General? Where? Text? Where is this one? I can never find this one. I think it's under general. Zoom. Adjust window when changing font size. There it is. I hate that setting. Okay. Because what I like to do is I like to be able to increase the font size. Uh, we've got a, a spam problem here in the chat, unfortunately. Ugh. Thank you. Thank you to the uh, volunteer moderators who are uh, inevitably going to help out with this. Sorry, everybody. Why? Why? Why, people? Why can't we just enjoy a Thursday morning of coding live on the internet? I'm going to try to do something about this as well. I don't like what did so did I do something to prompt this? There's so many people all of a sudden. Is it like a some kind of a emoji army coming to DDoS? What is going on? Why does this happen? I guess I could turn, maybe I should turn on slow mode. IP ban, all right, all right everybody. <sighs> You'll get to enjoy the this dot song while I figure this out. As always, I always forget the this dot, this dot, this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, this dot. I'm waiting for your instructions in this dot. Slow mo. Okay, let's do slow mo. Okay. 
This dot, this dot, I'm gonna do this dot, this dot, I'm gonna do this, this dot, this dot, this dot, I'm gonna do this dot, this dot, I'm gonna do dot, this dot, this dot, this dot, I'm gonna do this dot, this dot, I'm gonna do this dot, this dot, this dot, I'm gonna do this dot, this dot, I'm gonna do this dot, this dot. Sorry, it's gonna take me a minute to get to this. I'm logged in the wrong account. No, I'm not. Right this dot. Studio. This dot. Studio. Never forget to this dot. I'm gonna do the this dot. This dot. This dot. This dot. The this dot song. Never forget the this dot. But somebody composed that song for me. Getting to the place where I think I can enable slow mode. Uh. YouTube changed so many things in Creator Studio, I cannot find it. <laughs> because there's an, let me go to live. Ugh. All right, well. Where is slow mode? Oh yeah, the worst is over. All right. Well, I can't figure out how to find silly slow mode anyway. Is it here? Could I do it in the chat window itself? Ah, manage moderators for toggle timestamps. No. Uh, analytics viewer activity, stream health. There's no slow mode anywhere. Settings. Wow, embedding, live chat, found it. Okay, should I, uh, should I enable it? Or is it, it's over now, I guess. All right, I know where it is now, so if it happens again, I will enable slow mode. Slow mode would still be appreciated. All right, let's add slow mode. Uh, I'm just gonna, should I just do like five seconds between messages? Let's try that. Okay. <clears throat> Back to our regularly scheduled programming. Okay, so the first thing that I like to do with my uh, console setup is to install something called oh my ZSH. So first of all, uh, um, so uh, there are different uh, shell systems that people like to use. Um, I've been using ZSH recently, and then this oh my ZSH is, is essentially a theme which sets up various defaults and colors for um, knowing what GitHub branch you're on and things like that in terminal. So I'm going to grab this um, little command here from the oh my ZSH uh, homepage. I'm going to run it. And now I am back to what I'm used to. So this just shows me um, what it shows me here is a little tilde as the prompt. You'll see in a little bit, if I get into a GitHub repo, that it will show me more information about that and various other things. Okay. Now, the next thing that I want to do is see if I have Node. So I have Node installed. And that seems like a recent enough version. Um, now, I'm pretty sure um, one of the things I like to do is make sure that Node is installing global packages to a directory that's part of my user account, rather than like it down into the depths of the system files of the machine across all users. And there's actually a really nice web page that gives you instructions for that. And anytime I'm looking for it, I just look, search fix global permissions error um, npm. Um, and then it's taking me to this npm JS uh, documentation page. Um, and if you're wondering what's Node, what are Node packages, I would refer you to some of the other videos I've done that have gone through that. But this, what I like to do is put a directory um, and my, uh, my us at my user level, um, which is what this tilde slash means, called npm global. So let me do this. Then I'm going to call um, npm 
config set prefix, so it knows about this directory. Then I need to add it to the um, path. Uh, the, the, pa the path is an environment variable of your machine. I mean, it's different on different operating systems where it will look up where executables are for any commands you type in. So I'm going to add this as part of my path. And then this, in theory, I don't know. This is, shouldn't work, right? Because I'm using ZSH. So I probably need to say source tilde dot ZS or whatever. Let's just see what happens. Like, what was this going to do? They're right, there's no such file. So instead, I would say source ZSH, ZSHRC. So that's the configuration file for my ZSH bash. So that should add this path export to that permanently. That is now done. And now if I do something like say npm install dash g http server, which is a node package I use quite a bit to run a web server, it should work. And I can even just go to, um, hold on, here. And I don't see that npm global because the Mac is hiding my um, hidden files. But I think if I do this, there we go. I, uh, shift command dot. By the way, it's so useful on a Mac, at least, will show all the hidden files. And you can see now under NPM Global, that's where uh, the node modules are that I've installed, most notably HTTP server. So that's useful to know. Um, now, the other thing is I need to make sure, do I have Git? Yes, it knows about Git. If I do like Git config, how do I tell it to like tell me what's in Git config? I know how to like set something. Uh, show contents of git config. Git config list. Ooh. Oh, so all that's there, who knows what this is, this credential helper. Oh my goodness. I'm going to have to do so much here. So first of all, I need to set who I am. Um, and so to do that, um, Um, I can say git config dash dash global user dot name shiftman git config dash dash global uh, is it like email what is it git email what is it um, user dot email pretty sure this is the one that I use. Um, and git config dash dash list. There we go. I'm lost in Vim again. All I know, colon Q, colon Q, colon Q. That's what I use. Um, ah, also I could say, I could just look at the git config file, which is there. Okay. Um, so that's done. But what if I want to, so one of the things that I want to do right now um, in order to do this tutorial, which I'm barely going to get to today, is um, clone the ML5 library repo. Um, and so I like to use an SH, SSH key. And so I'm going to set that up right now. <laughs> um, so I, I should like make video tutorials on all these things. But I'm just going to do it kind of quickly. So let me see what happens. It should give me an error. Maybe it's just going to work. Right, permission denied. So I could get this to work by changing to HTTPS. Um, oh, it uses less. That wasn't Vim. <laughs> I don't know anything. Uh, <coughs> and um, uh, that was so that was less, not Vim. Um, but so what I need to do is. Um, and I, I might need to like not show you my computer screen for part of this, but um, because I've got all my, I don't want to. But this is what I want to do. So uh, generate a new SSH key. Actually, can I check? I don't have an existing one. So it'd be impossible. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to generate a key with this command uh, for my email. This is my. Email. 
I'm just going to, I think I, all the defaults are going to be fine with me. What's your opinion on whether I should use a passphrase? I mean, I know I should use a passphrase, but can I get away with no passphrase uh, live streaming? I think I'm going to try this. Uh, no passphrase. No passphrase. Ah, oh, no, wait. Uh, have I just, like, <sighs> allowed people to hack things? I'm not adding it to GitHub yet. All right, so I, I feel like, does this random art image, can you engineer the key from this image that it's showing me? Let me run through these again. Oh, I'm overwriting it. I did that again, but I'm overwriting it so you can't see that art image. I don't know if that's a security issue. Yeah, exposed. Um, okay. Um, now, I need to add the key to my SSH agent. And then I need to do this. Add the, uh, your SSH private key to the SSH agent and store your passphrase in the keychain. Okay. So that's done. And now what I need to do is just add the SSH key to my GitHub account. So this is where <laughs> I am going to, unfortunately, I think, log out. Because uh, I'm uh, not log out, but just hide my screen and I'll show you. But what I'm going to do is I'll just show you. what I, I'm going to go to up here, and then I'm going to go to uh, settings. So I'm going I'm to hide my screen for a second and click on settings. And then I'm going to go to SSH and GPG keys. Um, and I'm going, so on this screen, I think that it's got my MAC addresses and various things, so I'm not going to show it. Um, there could be, oh, it's only the public key that was shown, okay. There could be, um, sorry, I'm reading the chat. The, um, I, I should figure out a way to make a tutorial with like a dummy GitHub account. That would be a good way of doing this. But I'm going to, I'm now pressing <laughs> new SSH key. I'm calling this coding train login. And then I'm going to paste my key in by um, copying it. So this, by the way, is how I can actually just say copy my public key. And then I'm going to go back into the GitHub interface and paste it in and add it. And I'm just going to show you what I, so no, it's still got a, like a MAC address or something there. Um, so I'm not going to show it to you. Um, all right, so that should be done now. Uh, and I'm closing all this. If I did it correctly, I should be able to go to documents. Whoops, yes, allow. I'm going to make a directory called ML5. And I'm going to say git clone. And I'm going to go back to the ML5 library. And I am receiving the ML5 library. Okay, there we go. So the reason why I'm doing this is because um, I want to make an example that uses the ML5 neural network function. I'm finishing off this series. This has been the stuff that I've been teaching this semester. Um, and if I go to the ML5 website, go to the reference, and go to neural network, um, you'll see this is already a part of ML5, the current release, and I have used it in examples. But Joey Lee, who is one of the um, contributors and has really been doing a lot of work this year and over the past year to manage, uh, lead the development of the library, um, has been refactoring it. The neural network library has made some updates and changes. Nothing really changes in terms of the 
user-facing aspect of the library, but the behind the scenes has changed. And so to make sure everything I'm doing is working correctly, I, even if there hasn't been a release yet, I want to build my own version of the library that I can use for the purpose of this tutorial. So you're going to get to see a little extra thing about how do you build the ML5 library. So first step was clone the repo. That's been done now. Um, and I also want to find out, I also want to look, I'm already here, I want to look at his recent pull request, which is refactor and re-implementation of neural network. Um, because I, I want to know the branch. So this is the branch that I care about. Is that an image? That's so weird. Does GitHub make that into an image or, oh, like, oh, I can copy, I can copy it. Okay, that's what I wanted to do. Um, because, so first of all, you can see why I like oh my ZSH. It's showing me that I'm in a Git repo and that's the branch that I'm on. I want to do Git check out this particular branch because I want to build from that branch. Um, do I need to, is it already, I, I, I guess it has everything. Um, and then now I'm going to go to the library page and follow the instructions for building the library, which should be under contributing. Um, and it's pretty simple if you have everything installed. Um, basically, um, <coughs> the first thing that I, I've already done these steps, like I have Node and Git and all those things installed. I've cloned the repo. I'm using an SSH key. Um, and now I'm going to change into ML5 library. I'm there already. I'm going to type npm install. So this should take a little bit. This is installing all the packages and dependencies that the library needs to be built. So Simon, uh, who's commenting on various things that I need as part of my workflow, I'm going to do things as I need them. So I don't need a list right now is uh, unnecessary because when I need live server, I will install it and, and, uh, and various other things. Okay. So now that I've done this, uh, one thing I want to do is let me just open the source code for the library in Visual Studio Code, which I've already installed. I haven't configured. There might be some settings and things. And one of the things that I really like to be able to do is type code from the command line. Oh, and it worked. I guess I already installed that at some point. But I want to say code dot because I want to open up the ML5 library. So uh, to do that, if, if that doesn't work uh, natively on your computer, if you're, if you're using Visual Studio Code, Come on, <laughs> let me, there we go. Um, then what you can do is do shift command P, which brings up all of these commands. And then uh, if I type in command, install code command in path. That's what you need to do. So I, I really like having this feature because um, I can quickly from the command line just open a folder in Visual Studio Code, which I have now just done. And what I reason why I wanted to show you package.json, woo! So I'm definitely going to need to do change some settings. Let's change the font size to maybe the editor font size to 36. Um, let's look at package.json again. That's better. Let me move this here. Um, so what I'm looking for is uh, scripts. These are all the things I can run. NPM run commit, NPM run prebuild, NPM run. And the ones that I care about actually right now are NPM run start and NPM run build. These are just aliases to a longer command. Webpack dev server, Webpack. So Webpack is a bundling thingy framework that does all of the work of bundling all of the source files into one JavaScript library file. Um, and uh, I most often use WebPM, uh, sorry, NP, WebPM, <laughs> NPM run start because I want to run a web server that's constantly rebuilding the library as I make changes. But in this case, I just want the current version of the library. So I'm going to run NPM run build. Maybe I'll make this a little smaller just so it fits in one line. Oh, 
Oh, this takes a long time. <laughs> All right, let me go. Um, so then when I need to figure out what Visual Studio Code settings I want, <laughs> I go over to the coding garden, the CJ, who keeps track of all of the extensions um, he uses. So let's see if I can find that. Uh, coding garden, uh, VS Code extensions. Mm, does anybody know where this is? Coding garden. Let's go to the coding garden website. View the gear, support. Um, could it be gear to stream? No. Oh, this is, this is super useful, though. Ooh, I need some of this stuff. Okay. Um, where, 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 where? Search, filter. This, by the way, Coding Garden, like, like streaming goals is Coding Garden. Look how nicely organized everything is, and there's like a custom search and a link. It's just wonderful. Coding Garden does such a great job. But does anybody know where that is? Maybe it's on the GitHub. Coding Garden GitHub. Let's try this. VS Code settings. There we go. <laughs> this is what I was looking for. Um, <coughs> we're at one hour. Thank you, Simon, for that reminder. I am getting close to my uh, contractually obligated break. Um, theme. Uh, um, I kind of am a default theme sort of person. The thing that I want to know is style formatting, beautify, okay? So let's use, let's, I, I, the thing that I like the most is style and formatting. So let's install this, ESLint, I want to have this, okay? Then let's install beautify. I don't know, it's only got a four star rating. It's only 112 ratings. Somebody tell me to stop now before I go forward. I guess I can always uninstall it. I think this is what I was using before as well. I know there's something built in. Then um, something that I definitely want is um, save, format on save. Code actions on save, format on save. So I like to have four, this is, it can cause you some problems, but I like to have format a file on save. Um, let's do that. I th uh, the bracket colorizer thing is pretty cool, too. I'm a little bit afraid to install it because it's very visually noisy, but I guess I could always disable it. Let's install it for right now. So this is something that like provides a lot of visual information to you to see which brackets match up and parentheses match up with other brackets and parentheses. It's got a lot of stars. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay, that's good. And we can see, um, so good. Is this still going? Oh, all right, so this, this works. So now we can see that it, um, there should now be a new folder. This, I, I didn't show, this wasn't there before. This is the version of the library that I just built. And what I'm going to do is because when I start making this coding example an hour, over an hour into this live stream, um, uh, let's see. Can I get away with 32 here? Um, this is going to be PoseNet example one. I want to just use a locally uploaded version of the library. And so I'm going to add the file. I'm going to drag that here. So this is how I can now make a coding example with my temporary um, custom build of the ML5 library, knowing that by the time this video is out, that this will be in the release. So I won't be mentioning this in the edited version. I'm just showing this now. This will be closed, um, and I will just be in uh, sketch.js. But I should be able to see console.log ML5. It's loaded the library. I can see it down here. OK. Any 
questions about what I have done so far. Yeah, Nathan is saying I remember you had prettier instead of beautifier, and I think that I did have prettier. But I just, I always just go with whatever CJ has. <laughs> oh, one thing that I want to check, um, really just as a quick technical thing, is I've been recording with a new piece of software called vMix, and I want to just see if, oh, no, 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 don't stop. I want to see sort of like a status report. 200 and two dropped frames in an hour and 10 minutes. Um, my question would be, is that significant? I don't know. We will find out, I suppose. Okay. Uh, boy, there's a lot of messages here. All right, so I'm going to take a short break, but before I take my short break, I want to take a moment to thank today's uh, sponsor. It's my friends over at Dashlane. So you might be wondering, hey, I noticed you're logged in to the P5 web editor. You can't even see that as, uh, as Coding Train. And I'm going to log out for a second, and I'm going to show you how easy it is for me to log in. Um, just using Dashlane logs me right in. <laughs> So uh, Dashlane is a password manager. I cannot live um, without a password manager. And um, the, you know, the main benefit that you really get from it is just like a shortcut for everything that you want to do on the internet. So you can fly through forms and breeze through checkouts. Um, it lets you fill out forms like really quickly, one-click logins, autofill for all of your payment stuff, which I use a lot too. I have like too many, can't keep track of all this stuff. Um, you know, I used, you know, you keep all of your stuff in a Google Doc, all of your, like a list of all your passwords and credit card numbers. Don't do that. Don't do that. Use something else, whether it's Dashlane or not. But Dashlane is an option for you um, as a password manager. And, and um, what's nice is you can have it on your phone or any operating system, and it syncs and all of that stuff. Um, you know, there are other services like Keychain and Chrome, but you're you're really locked into a single system, so everything's trapped in one place. And you know, there's other systems that maybe aren't as reliable, um, at, uh, maybe, maybe don't take privacy as um, seriously. Dashlane never has access to your personal data um, and won't trick you into subscribing. So um, you can sign up at uh, dashlane.com slash coding train. Um, there's no credit card required. Um, it's always an ad-free product, <laughs> like the coding train apparently, because this is an ad. Um, you, can, um, you can go to dashlane.com slash coding train. You get a free 30-day trial of Dashlane Premium. So all, you'll be able to try out all the features. And then if you choose, if you do like it and choose to purchase it, um, if you use the coding train coupon uh, at checkout, you will also get 10% off a discount off of um, the Dashlane Premium. So thank you so much. Um, you know, there's a, a, for to Dashlane for supporting the channel. It's um, I really appreciate it. Um, if you if it, if it seems that it might be something that would interest you, uh, if you check it out through that link, that'll know that um, I sent you there, and that will uh, help me out a little bit. So um, I'm going to take a break. You can you can take a minute to sign up. Oh, before I take a break, let me try to do something. Uh, so sign up for now or just hang out, listen to some music. I have something, I was hoping this thing that I have, which is not as exciting as I'm making it seem to be, would come in before, um, before I live stream so I could use it as an interstitial, um, but it didn't. So I'm gonna, just give me a minute here, because I'm gonna, I'm gonna put something different on the screen during my break. And I'm also, I'm, I've lost the chat. Back up, and I, 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 you know, there's not a lot of time left today. This was a get this bit of a housekeeping live stream. Um, um, and so, let me see if I can how I can get to this. Ah, uh, it's going to take me a little bit, everybody. It's going to be worth it. It's not worth it. But when else am I going to do it? Just talk amongst yourself. Sign up for Dashlane. Donate to the Processing Foundation. Any of these things. Can't see my screen, right? Okay, good. Oh, 
wrong thing. Okay, everybody. I'm doing something very important. This is taking way too long, but it's fine. Hold on everybody, I'm almost there. Almost there. Media source, maybe. Um, okay. Huh? Can OBS not read an MOV file? I don't know why. Uh, I don't know why I turned that off. Um, hold on, everybody. Everything's gonna be okay. Oh, VLC player. No, VLC player. What fight? So VLC can play it. If I export it, convert, save. Why 
I wanted play. All right, I failed. DLC video source. Let's do this. Oh. Okay, hold on. Hold on. Uh, okay. Uh. All right. Never mind, everybody. <laughs> Sorry. I have a nice little looping animation of this train. <laughs> and I was trying to get OBS to play it so that it would be there when I take a break. Instead, it's just going to be this. Back in just a few minutes, I'm going to get some water, OK? I'm going to say once again, 
Here we go. Sing it with me. It's the forward to Cartesian coordinate songs. It's the forward to Cartesian coordinate songs. Auto-tune and the internet will fix that for me. Sing it with me. It's the forward to Cartesian coordinate songs. 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 Unicorns and rainbows and cupcakes. What else is there? Yes, kittens. Thank you very much. Kittens and rainbows and cupcakes. Notice that. And look what I get. I'm really losing my mind. Okay, let's do it. Kittens and kittens and kittens and kittens and kittens kittens and 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 kittens. Right. Here we are again. Everybody. I feel just sort of like a nice <coughs> feeling huh. of relaxation. How do we get to be a little bit okay today? How, how, how? Broken. It has not frozen. This is, a, this is a wonderful thing. Okay, we're going to do it. I'm really getting to something. I need my sound effect. <laughs> so Ryan Turk, right? I don't know why, but this song is bordering on from That's fair. All right. Um, I, I noticed there were maybe some issues because the audio is coming through the mic and also is being sent out through the uh, capture card, and maybe there's like a lag between them. So sorry if there's some weird music issues. I would like to accomplish something today beyond my ramblingness. And so um, let me tell you what I'm hoping to accomplish at this point by the end of tomorrow. And then we'll jump right into it tomorrow. Um, it's, this is, it's tricky because it's, uh, for me, this is the end of the NYU semester. So it's kind of like the busiest time. I'm kind of exhausted, if I'm being honest. And But it's like a lot of stuff to like catch up on and finish up for the year. And I kind of want to, I missed streaming last week, so I feel like I want to do all this stuff. Um, <clears throat> but let me, uh, so you might remember that I used, uh, I made a previous series, let me get my water here, about this uh, project called Teachable Machine from Google Creative Lab. And when I did this series, I didn't touch on um, this particular pose, um, the pose model that you could train. So let me just show you really quickly. So for example, what I'm going to do um, <laughs> is call this Y. Oh, wait, no, hold on. Uh, so I'm going to record for 30 seconds. And I'm going to give myself a five second delay. And let me get rid of these. And let's record. 
Oh boy, I need more room. <laughs> There's my Y. Oh, it's still recording. <laughs> this is my Y. Ah, 30 seconds is a long time. I did not need to record for 30 seconds. Uh, so PoseNet, which is the machine learning model that is uh, tracking all these points, uh, clearly uh, this is not the optimal. All right, let's, let's do an M. And I, don't, uh, I guess I did 30 seconds before, but let's just do 15 seconds. <laughs> this is no good one. <laughs> See? This is a C, not an M. The point is, you can train a machine learning model to uh, assign labels to various poses. And the data for those poses that I'm collecting are the x, y locations of all these key points on a pose net skeleton. <coughs> and then if I were to train this model, uh, let's see how that goes. Wow, it's taking a long time. Um, Oh, hello, everybody. I did a pose project with the snake game. Right, but I wasn't using, so this is a really good point. Abhijit is mentioning in the chat that what I, I so this is, this is great. So I actually want to reference that. So I did different poses for the snake game, but it wasn't actually, the data for the, the data was not the locations of the various parts of my body, but rather the pixels of the image that it was seeing. So in that sense, as soon as I would turn the camera and have a different background, it wouldn't work anymore. But if I actually train a model with my pose positions, then that would still apply no matter, uh, uh, even if I like, took, took my laptop to a different location with different lighting conditions and a different background. So this is one of the advantages of doing it this way. Okay. Um, all right, I, I'm not going to keep going with this. <laughs> um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to ML5.js. Oh, what happened to that sketch that I had open? Um, pose that example. Okay. Um, reference. Whoops. So by the way, here's something that somebody could um, file as an issue for the ML5 website or even actually uh, fix this by just clicking edit this document. This should be a link to, um, this should be a link to um, this actual um, blog post. Real-time human pose estimation in the browser with TensorFlow.js. Um, and in addition to it actually being a link for accessibility, this is um, uh, you know, one of the principles of accessibility, in particular for uh, users of the web who, um, who um, use a screen reader, is when things are linked with generic language, it's not as helpful as if there is uh, information about the content in the uh, in the text that is linked itself. So this should probably say something like, the original post that model was ported to TensorFlow.js by Dan Oved. You know, read more at, and then the name of the article, real-time human pose estimation in the browser with TensorFlow.js or something, and, and actually link the name of the article. So if anybody wants to do that pull request right now, uh, you c I would do that here live, but I've already spent enough time doing random other things. Uh, you can actually get to it from clicking edit document. Um, okay. But I'm going to go to that blog post. I'm just going to look at, yeah, I'm just going to remember. Where's 
looking here. Always returns an array. Okay. So I'm looking, I wanted to find something, I just want to be able to reference the training data. I'm kind of assuming that it used um, Coco. Uh, this is more information than we need for this purpose of this video. Sorry, does any, I'm Oh right, there's a version 2.0 actually. Um I believe the training code is closed source, so I don't actually know uh, what it was used, to what data was used to train. I was hoping at least would tell me the data set somewhere here, but I'm not seeing it. Um, uh, <laughs> Onward is pointing, it's an hour and a half already, we didn't start. I know, I know. This is the, I just, this is, just, this is just what's happening this week for me. Thank you for your patience. I'm just going to go forward. OK. <clears throat> OK. All right. Um, <clears throat> Let me um, add to this example Is that how it works? Create capture video or create video capture? I can't remember. Okay, it's definitely this. Um, and then let's do... Uh, Okay. This is going to be better anyway because the square was a problem. Um, okay. Oh, I should get an external webcam. I have an idea. Uh, 
I'll, you know what, I will get the external webcam for tomorrow when I come back to finish this. Well, it's the, okay. <coughs> All right, here we go. I'm going to make a video tutorial about PoseNet. And um, then <laughs> I'll have accomplished something today. OK. <coughs> Hello, and welcome to another Beginner's Guide to Machine Learning with ML5.js video. I, in this video, I'm going to cover the, that was my one start over <laughs> option. <coughs> Hello and welcome to another Beginner's Guide to Machine Learning video tutorial. In this video, I am going to cover the pre-trained model PoseNet, and I'm going to look at what PoseNet is, how to use it with the ML5.js library, with the P5.js library, and track your body in the browser in real time. That's my statement of what I'm going to show you. Thank you for editing. <laughs> I used to say, like, that'll be edited out, and that would be just in all my videos, and now things get edited out. I don't know if really that's better or not. Um, I just realized that the whiteboard camera is not on. Come on, whiteboard camera. How does this look? Oh, boy. This camera is like crooked, right? <laughs> By the way, one thing I did is I f hopefully fixed the white balance of these cameras, and they are, um, that's better now. Um, <coughs> the white balance is, yeah, the white balance is uh, fixed now, so it might look off, but at least it can be color corrected later, and it won't like auto adjust. Okay. The model I want to look at is PoseNet. And with, uh, what? This camera is so much lower than it was. <laughs> I wrote that at a very reasonably normal height. You can't see it at all. Right? That was so weird. The camera's got lower somehow. I'm not sure why. Oh, it's pointing down a little bit. That's fine. Oh, you could see my, almost see my legs. <laughs> I have legs. High knees, everybody. High knees. <laughs> <coughs> okay. Oh, that hurt. Oh. Um, I'll fix that later. And I've got the sniffles all of a sudden. The model I want to look at is PoseNet. Oh, no, no. <laughs> the worst. Matt, too, we'll do our like speeding up as I draw stuff. I love that. I love that. <laughs> Even if it's just like a little bit. The model that I, wa the model that I want to look at is PoseNet. With any machine learning model, the first question we should ask is, what are the inputs and what are the outputs? And in this case, oh, let me start the whole thing over. I got it. I got it. I, got it. I know what I'm doing now, everybody. <laughs> the model, as I mentioned, that I'm looking at is called PoseNet.
With any machine learning model that you use, the first question you probably want to ask is, what are the inputs? And what are the outputs? And in this case, the PoseNet model is expecting an image as input. And then, as output, it is going to give you an array of coordinates. In addition to each of these x, y coordinates, it's going to give you a confidence score for each one. And what do all these x, y, <laughs> and what do all these x, y coordinates and confidence scores correspond to? They correspond to correspond. <coughs> My voice is cracking. I'm sniffling. This is all going, going downhill fast, people. <clears throat> and what do all these x, y coordinates and confidence scores correspond to? <laughs> is that <it> again? <clears throat> So I'm like, I should use an external webcam. You know what I have right here? A camera, an external camera. I should just send this into PoseNet and then track my, but whatever. I don't know how to get the, this in, in, into P5.js. Right. And what do all these x, y coordinates correspond to? They correspond to the key points on a PoseNet skeleton. Now, the PoseNet skeleton isn't an anatomically correct skeleton. It's an arbitrary skeleton that involves, wait, okay, hold on. Let me actually just do that again. Now, the PoseNet skeleton isn't an anatomically correct skeleton. It's an arbitrary set of 17 points on the human body that it is looking for. And you can see those listed all right here from nose all the way down to right ankle. Um, and each one of these gets an X location, a Y location, and a confidence score. Needed. Um, what else do I want to talk about? This is the craziest live stream ever. I don't know. I've had some pretty crazy live streams. When you see the full body, all, I'm, I'm going to just add something here later for this. Mathieu and I will add something. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, can, we can add something. Yeah. Mm. I'm so tired. <laughs> when can I be done? Oh, it's all 11.50. No, I got to finish this. Come on. <coughs> energy, people, energy. Now, the, the PoseNet skeleton isn't necessarily an anatomically correct skeleton. It's just an arbitrary set of what is 17 points that you can see right over here uh, from the nose all the way down to the right ankle that it is trying to estimate where those positions are on the human body and give you x, y coordinates as well as how confident it is that it's correct about those points. Um. Let me make some footage here. Um, so 
this can potentially be used, actually maybe I won't do this right now, I'll, I'll do this later. Um, Now the other question you should always ask yourself when you're working with a pre-trained model is who trained the model, what data did they use to train the model, and what are some of the pitfalls that might arise based on how the process of collecting that data? Well, what do I want to say exactly? I just want to like, hmm. let, me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me say this one more time. Also, whenever you use a pre-trained model, one of the things I started by emphasizing that when you use a pre-trained model, you want to make sure you understand what are the inputs that are expected and what are the outputs. The other thing that you really want to think about as you go to use the model is how was this model trained? What data set was used to train it? How was that data collected? Who collected the data? And is there any reason why you might not want to use the model based on that data that was collected? Maybe the data wasn't... Um, Oh, I forgot that I'm live streaming to the public. Sometimes I just do these recording, I didn't really forget. Sometimes I do these recording sessions like this where I just go on, on trying, saying the same thing over and over again. I have to like stop myself from doing this. I'm gonna move on, all right. So I started by emphasizing how when you're using a pre-trained model, you wanna look at what the inputs are and their corresponding outputs. But another thing you really wanna think about and do some research is how was the model trained? Who trained the model? What data was used to train the model? How was that data collected? And what are the kinds of questions that you wanna consider um, around those details that might lead you to <laughs> I shouldn't be reading the chat. I, I finally almost got this sentence the, exactly the way that I want it. Good acting, thank you, Chris. Uh, Abhijit has to leave. Um, physics exam, go, go study for your physics exam. Take that, don't, don't, don't watch this nonsense of me repeating the same sentence. This is, I'm trying to get this right because my, this tutorial is really not about the, um, the, law, this big, the story around data collection for machine learning, but I want to emphasize how, even if you're just kind of quickly using PoseNet for an interactive project, it's important to be thoughtful about these questions, so. This will be the last time. I don't think I need to say this thing about how I began. Another thing you want to consider when using a pre-trained model is to be, yeah. Something else you want to consider when using a pre-trained model is who trained the model and what, uh, something you want to think about, prestige, I agree, blah, blah, blah. People I don't understand how people are writing best teacher ever when all I'm doing is like not getting anywhere in my thoughts. Okay. <coughs> One other important question you should ask yourself and do some research about whenever you find yourself using a pre-trained model out of the box, something that somebody else trained, is who trained that model? Why did they train that model? What data was used to train that model? And how is that data collected? So PoseNet is a bit of a unique uh, uh, animal in the PoseNet is a bit of an odd case because the model itself, the trained model, is open source. You can use it, you can download it. There's examples for it in TensorFlow, in TensorFlow.js, in ML5.js. But the actual code for training the model, from what I understand or what I've been able to find, is closed source. So there aren't a lot of details. Uh, Coco dataset. A data set that is commonly used for training models. A data set that's 
A data set that's used often in training models around images is COCO, our common objects in context. And it has a lot of labeled images of people striking poses with their key points marked. So I don't know for a fact whether COCO was used exclusively for training PoseNet, whether it was used partially or not at all. But your best bet for a starting point for finding out as much as you can about the PoseNet model is to go directly to the source, the GitHub repository for PoseNet. In fact, there's a PoseNet 2.0 coming out. And there also is a wonderful, uh, a, a, a web, there, there also is an excellent blog post called Real-Time Human Pose Estimation in the Browser with TensorFlow.js that was written by Dan Oved. Uh, that was written by Dan Oved. Yeah, I'm just going to. That was written by Dan Oved with, uh, a, yeah. That was written by Dan Oved with illustration, well, um, thank you, Arif. <laughs> Everybody's so nice in the chat today. Thank you. <laughs> really appreciate it. <clears throat> your best bet for doing some re you, you should also make sure to I would also highly suggest you read the blog post, Real-Time Human Pose Estimation in the Browser with TensorFlow.js by Dan Oved and editing and illustrations from Irene Alvarado and Alexis Gallo. So there's a lot of excellent background information about how the model was trained and, and about how the model was trained and other relevant details. Okay, now. No, oh, humans of AI. Hold on, I want to say one other thing. No, oh, blip. Here we go. And if you want to learn more about the COCO image data set, I highly suggest you check out the Humans of AI project by Philip Schmidt. If you want to learn more about the COCO image data set, I also would point you towards the Humans of AI project by Philip Schmidt, which is an artwork, an online exhibition that takes a critical look at the data in that data set itself. Okay. Now, most likely, if you, most likely, if you're here, the reason why you might be interested in PoseNet is because Wow, I can make an interactive project that just knows where my hands are, my shoulder is, and, and, and anybody can walk up to and interact with it. I can do body tracking in real time in the browser with a web camera. And yes, in fact, you can. So that's what I'm going to show you code-wise how to do right now. And the easiest way to get started with that, from my point of view, is the P5 web editor with the P5 library. I have a basic sketch that's just opening up a connection to the webcam and drawing the video right here. And now I'm going to add the ML5 library to it. So I have the ML5. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Take a deep breath. It helps speak without stuttering. Am I stuttering? Ah. Oh, I got a little dizzy there. <clears throat> now, for you, in many cases, if you're interested in PoseNet, it's just because, wow, I have an interactive project I want to make, and I can, let, let me say,
Now for you watching this video, my guess is you've arrived here because you want to make something, an interactive project with gesture, with body tracking. And PoseNet is a really quick and easy way of doing so in the browser. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, it's 12 o'clock. I'm going to have a little more time. What am I doing? What am I doing? If you found your way to this video, most likely you're here because you're making interactive media projects, and PoseNet is a tool that you can use to do real-time body tracking very quickly and easily. It's it's so frankly pretty amazing that you can do this with just a webcam image. So one way to get started, which in my view is one of the easiest way, is with the P5 web editor uh, and the P5.js library, which very uh, so I have a sketch here which connects to the camera and just draws the image in a canvas. You also need to make sure you have the ML5 library imported. That would be through, uh, you also want to make sure you have the ML5.js library imported. The most recent ver, you also want to make sure you have the most recent version of the ML5.js library imported, and that would be through, what is it that you, a script tag. That's what I'm looking for. You also want to make sure you have the ML5.js library imported, and that would be through a script tag in index.html. And we'll, we'll create, some, I'll create something that'll just go on the screen there for that. Um, <clears throat> Once you've got all that set up, we're ready to start coding. So I'm going to create a variable called posenet. I'm going to say posenet equals new posenet. Oh, no, new, no. <laughs> None of that. I'm going to say, I'm going to say posenet equals ml5.posenet. So all the ML5 functions are initialized the same way by referencing the ML5 library dot the name of the function, in this case, PoseNet. Now, typically, there's some arguments that go here. And we can look up what those arguments are by going to the documentation page. Here we can see there's a variety. Here we can see there's a variety of different ways to create the post. Here we can see there's a variety. There's. <laughs> Here we can see there's a few different ways to. Uh, <laughs> Here we can see there's a few different ways to call the PoseNet function. Um, I just want to give it a video. And a, the way I want to do it actually isn't even listed here. I just want to give it a video and a callback. Oh. Interesting. Here we can see there's a few different ways we can call the PoseNet function. For us, I just want to do it the simplest way possible. I want to give it the video, which tells the ML5 PoseNet function that I just just I just gotta keep going. Uh, give me a second. I'm gonna stop stop. I'm gonna st stop stopping every two seconds. <laughs> I'm going to stop stopping. Stop stopping. Just gonna move along here. Here we can see there are a few different ways to call the PoseNet function. I want to do it the simplest way possible. I'm just going to give it the video element and a callback for when the model is loaded, which I don't even know that I need. I'll make sure there are no errors and run this again. And we can see PoseNet is ready. So I know I've got my syntax right. I've called the PoseNet function. I've loaded the model. PoseNet works a little bit different. 
The way PostNet works is actually a bit different than everything else in the ML5 library. And it works based on event handlers. So I want to set up a pose event by calling this method on. On pose, I want this function to execute. Whenever the PoseNet model detects a pose, then call this function and give me the results of that pose. Whenever I can add that right here in setup, pose net on pose. And then I'm going to give it a callback called got poses. And now, presumably, Every single time it detects a pose, it sees me, it sees my skeleton, it will log that to the console right here. So this is working. I can see it logging it here. So now that it's running, I can see the, all these objects being logged. Let's look, let's, let's take a look at, <laughs> now that it's working, I can see a bunch of objects being logged. Let's take a look at what's inside those objects. Oh, P5 web editor. So while the, the P5 web editor's built in, uh, so while the P5 web editor's built in console is really useful for basic debugging. Sometimes when I want to investigate all of the details of a JavaScript object, I want to open. Uh, it's <laughs> so even though the P5 web editor's, so the P5 web editor's console is incredibly useful for basic debugging, but sometimes when I want to investigate the depths of everything that's within a JavaScript object, I find it a little bit easier to look at the native console itself. So I'm going to do that right now. And so I have the Chrome I have the developer, the browser developer console open right here. I'm actually going to stop the sketch from running. Let me stop the sketch from running. I've stopped the sketch from running, and I've zeroed in on one of these objects that's been logged to the console. And I'm looking at the built-in browser console here. And we can see that it gives me an array. So what's in the array? Every single pose that it detects, there could be three or four people here, is an element in the array. And each element of the array is an object with multiple properties. There's a pose property and a skeleton property. Let's look at the pose property first. Whoops. Why is it, huh? What? Is just my browser broken? Oh, is it because I stopped the sketch and it doesn't know what it is anymore? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> do this. Let me, let me do this again. <laughs> All the way, once again, from the top. The P5 Web Editor console is super useful for basic debugging, but, but sometimes when I want to look at the depths and investigate everything that there is to do with a particular JavaScript object that I'm logging, it's a bit easier to go to the, the developer tools of the, the browser itself. In this case, I can get to them through a quick key command or just in Chrome view developer uh, JavaScript console. Yeah, I don't need to say, I'm not going to include those details here. Sorry. Ah. <laughs> 
once again from the top. It's PoseNet time, PoseNet time on the <laughs> coding train. <clears throat> The console in the P5 web editor is incredibly useful uh, for basic debugging, but sometimes in this case, I really want to look deep into the internals of the JavaScript object that is the pose. Um, and so for that, I think the built-in uh, developer console in the uh, browser will be easier. I can get to that really easily, and I'm just going to pick any one of these. And here, I've got, a, an, uh, I've got one to look at. So we can see it right over here. It's uh, Each one of these things is an array with an object in it that uh, Could you start over? I just got here. <laughs> Last time, I swear. Poor Mathieu. Poor me. Poor you watching this. <clears throat> I can't believe I'm going to say this again. <laughs> Don't need to. It can be edited. The P5, the P5 console is very useful for your basic debugging. In this case, I really want to like dive deep into this object that I'm logging here, the poses object. So in this case, I'm going to open up the actual developer console of the browser. Um, I can see a lot of stuff being logged here very, very quickly. I'm going to pick any one of these and uh, un unfold it. So I can see that I have an array, and the first element of the array is a pose. There could be multiple poses that the model is detecting if there's more than one person. In this case, there's just one. And I can look at this object. It's got two properties, a pose, ob a pose property and a skeleton property. Definitely want to come back to the skeleton property, but let's start with the pose property. I can unfold that, and we can see, oh my goodness, look at all this stuff in here. So first of all, there's a score. So I mentioned how the um, that with each I mentioned that with each one of these x y positions of every key point, there is a confidence score. There is also a confidence score for the entire pose itself. And because the camera is seeing very little of me, it's quite low, just at thirty percent. Then I can actually access any one of those key points by its name nose, left eye, right eye, all these all the way down once again to right, an right ankle. So let's actually draw something based on any of those key points. We'll use my nose. So I'm going to make the assumption that there's always only going to be a single person. If, I, if there were multiple people, I'd want to do this differently. And I'm going to make a, I'm going to hit stop. I'm going to make a variable called pose. Then I'm going to say if it's found a pose, and I can check that by just checking the length of the array. If the length of the array is 0, then pose equals poses index 0. So I'm going to take the first pose from the array. I'm going to take the first pose from the array and store it into the global variable. But actually, if you remember, the object in the array has two properties, pose and skeleton. So it seems there's a lot of redundant lingo here, but I'm going to say poses index 0 dot pose. Actually, let me just do this. Ooh. Did. Oh, I see. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, this is fine. Poses index zero dot pose. Uh, I, this could be a good place to use the confidence score. Like, oh, only if it's like of a high confidence, actually use it. But I'm not. I'm just going to take any pose that it gives me. Then in the draw function. 
I can draw something based on Then, in the draw function, I can draw something based on that pose. So, for example, let me give myself a red nose. So now, if I run the sketch, ah, so I got an error. So pose could be, uh, first of all, let me take out the console log. This is a lot of extra stuff for it to do. Ah, so I got an error. So why did I get that error? The reason why I got that error is it hasn't found a pose yet, so there is no nose for it to draw. So I should always check to make sure there is a valid pose first. If there is a valid pose, then draw that circle. And there we go. I now have a red dot always following my nose. Right, thank you, Nathan, yeah. People are pointing out, Nathan is pointing out that sometimes when I'm going into the JavaScript console, I can't find the data anymore. It's because when I stop the sketch, it doesn't exist in memory anymore. It got cleaned up, so, okay. Um, all right, so now we have this. So as an exercise, if you're following along, you know, pause the video right now and then add two points for your hands and see if you can add, have like dip two different circles that are following your hands. Did you get that working? Here, I'll add it for you. Uh, whoops. I forgot what it's called. <laughs> oh, there's no hand. Wrist. It's the wrist. Andrew, right wrist, left wrist. Okay, sorry. If you're following along, <clears throat> if you're following along, pause the video and try to add two more points where your hands are. Now, there isn't actually a hand key point. It's a wrist key point, but that'll probably work for our purposes. I'll, I'll let you try that. How did that go? <laughs> okay, I'm going to add it for you now. Let's see if this works. Those were bad. I should probably have picked shoulders. So one thing you might notice is this is working terribly. Why is it working terribly? Because I'm not showing it my full body. So most likely this goes back to how the data, how, This is working terribly. 
I'm almost kind of getting it right. And there we go. But it, it, why is it working so poorly? Well, first of all, I'm barely showing, I'm only showing it from my waist up. And most likely the model was trained on full body images. Let me take a minute here. Now I turn the camera <laughs> I should probably um, Now I turn the camera to point at me over here and I'm further away and you can see how much more accurate this is because it sees so much more of my body I'm able to control where the wrists are and get pretty good accurate tracking as I'm standing further away from the model. Not the model, as I'm standing further away from the camera. <clears throat> we can also do some, there are also some nice tricks we could try. For example, I can estimate distance from the camera by looking at the... There are also some other interesting tricks we could try. For example, I could estimate distance from the camera by looking at how far apart are the eyes. So for example, here, I'm storing the right eye and left eye location in separate variables and then calling the P5 distance function to look at how far apart they are. And then I could just take that distance and assign it to the size of the nose. So as I get closer, the nose gets bigger. It, 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 you, you almost can't tell because it's sizing relative to my face, but it gives it more of a realistic appearance of an actual clown nose that's attached by changing its size according to the proportions of what it's detecting in the face. Just look at the pose again. Now, for, con for convenience, I was referencing each of those. Okay. Oops. 
So you might, be, you might be asking yourself, well, what if I want to draw all the points, all the points that it's tracking? So for convenience, I was referencing each point by name, right eye, left eye, nose, right wrist. But there's actually a key points array that has all 17 points in it. So I can use that to just loop through everything if that's what I want to do. So I can loop through all of the key points and get the x, y of each one. And then I can draw a green circle at each location. Whoop, what did I do wrong? Shoot. Oh, it's got a part and a position. Ugh. Oops, so that code didn't work because I forgot that each element, each key point is more than just an x, y. It's got the confidence score, it's got the name of the part, and a position. So I need the key points index zeros position dot x. Pose dot key points index i dot position dot x dot position dot y. Now I believe this will work. And I'm going to turn this over here. I'll stand back over here and we can see now I'm drawing, even if I get my leg up into the picture. <laughs> oh can I, I guess I could point it. I hurt myself. Can I get a full body picture, people? I'm going to make this happen. A little bit more slack here. Point it down a little bit. And here we go. The only thing I'm not seeing are my ankles. Oh, it's not. There we go. I got kind of accurate there. Here's my pose. <laughs> Okay, so you can see I'm getting all the points of my body right now, standing about probably six feet away from the camera. Whew. Okay, hold on everybody. Wait, where's the, why is the skeleton blank? Let me look at the example that draws. Draw skeleton. Oh, it's just not, this is awkward, hold on. Uh, is it drawing the skeleton? Oh yeah, it is. Interesting how, why does it only sometimes do that? That feels like a bug to me. Like why not just draw all the connected, I guess it's based on the confidence, but. Alright. 
So Amr, I did do this in a previous stream. Let me, I'll explain that in a minute. I, I'm doing this again though, because the previous stream I did this is like this one well over an hour. It was using a previous iteration of the library. So I don't have a nice succinct video tutorial for PoseNet, which is why I'm making this. Okay. Um, There's one other aspect to the data that I haven't shown you here. It, let me just see. Yeah, no, it's fine. There's one other aspect to the data that I haven't shown you here, and that's drawing the actual skeleton. In a lot of the demos that you see, there are lines connecting the different points. Now, you could just build your own lookup table of which points are connected to which points, but PoseNet will dynamically sort of like make guesses as to which points should be connected to which points based on like how you're standing, I guess. <laughs> so, and like why, why is there a separate skeleton thing? Why wouldn't that just be like a permanent, like these things are always connected, like the shoulder is always connected to the elbow? That doesn't make any sense to me. I guess. <clears throat> Right? Like with the connect, you just know which points are, like why is it not just like a permanent lookup table? Why is the skeleton something dynamic? Relates to the threshold. Does it have to do with the confidence scores? It must be. All right, I'm just gonna say I presume. Somebody will correct me. <coughs> There's one other aspect of this that I haven't shown you yet. So if you've seen demos of PoseNet and some of the examples, the points are connected with lines. So on the one hand, you could just memorize, like always draw a line between the shoulder to the elbow and the elbow to the wrist. But PoseNet, I, what I presume is based on the confidence scores, will dynamically give you back which parts are connected to which parts. And that's in the skeleton property of the, and that's in the skeleton property of the pose object that it returns when it gets results. And that's in the skeleton property of the poses, uh, <laughs> and that's in the skeleton property of the object found in the array that was returned to us. So I could actually add a new global variable called skeleton. This would have been good for Halloween. Skeleton equals, and let me just stop this for a second, uh, poses index zero dot skeleton. this work? For every, there's a, a zero and a one, part A and part B. Okay, fine. I can loop over the skeleton. I don't keep closing that. I can't memorize it. Yeah, that's what for every bow. And skeleton is actually a two-dimensional array because in the second dimension, it stores the two, the, the, uh, and skeleton is actually a two-dimensional array because in the second dimension, it, it holds the, the two locations that are connected. So I can say A equals skeleton index I index zero, and B is index one, and then I can just draw a line between the two of them.
So I look at every skeleton point, I get the two parts, part A, part B, and just draw a line between the X's and Y's of each of those. Make it a kind of thicker line and give it uh, the color white. And let's see what this looks like. And there we go. This, <laughs> I guess, Mathieu, you can edit back and forth between these two shots since we're recording them both. And there we go. This is my uh, pose net. And we can actually like even like side do them or something. And there we go. That's the full. And there we go. That's pretty much. And there we go. That's pretty much everything you can do with the ML5 PoseNet function. Right? This is what I'm going to mention this. So for you, you might try to do something like make a googly eyes. That's something I actually did in a previous video where I looked at an earlier version of PoseNet. And you can also look at some of these other examples that demonstrate other aspects. For example, you can actually find the pose of a JPEG that you, up, that you load rather than images from a webcam. But what I want to get to is what is But what I'm looking to do with this, which I'm going to get to in the next video, But what I want to do, which I'm going to get to in a follow-up video to this, is not take the outputs and draw something, but rather take these outputs and feed them as training data into ML5 neural network. What if I say, hey, every time I make this pose, label that a Y. And every time I make this pose, label that an M, a C, an A. You see where I'm going. Could I create a pose classifier? I can use all of the X, Y positions, label them, and train a classifier to make guesses as to my pose. This is very similar to what I did with the Teachable Machine image classifier. The difference is with the image classifier, as soon as I show it a different background, or I've, well, the difference is with the image classifier, as soon as I move the camera to a different room with different lighting and a different background with a different person, it's not going to be able to recognize the pose anymore because that was trained on the raw pixels. This is actually just trained on the relative positions. So in theory, somebody around the same size as me swapping out, it would recognize their pose. And there's actually a way that I could just normalize all the data so that it would work for anybody's pose potentially. So you can train your own pose classifier that will work generically in a lot of different um, environments. So if you make something with ML5 PoseNet, please share it with me. And um, so if you make something with ML5 PoseNet or with PoseNet with another environment, please share it with me. I would love to check it out. You can find the code for everything in this video in the link in this video's description. And I'll see you in a future coding train, ML5, machine learning, beginner, whatever, something, video. Oh, oh, goodbye. Okay. All right, everyone. It's 1240. This, this is it. I can always come back. So tomorrow, I'm going to do the classifier tomorrow. Um, I probably will live stream around the same time, 10 AM. Um, so stay tuned for that. Um, and there you go. I'm so exhausted. Um, I'll take a few questions if people want to ask. I'm going to stop all the recording um, and up start uploading that stuff. Uh, actually, you know what? For posterity's sake, I'm not going to stop it yet. I will, I will do that when I can. All right, any, any questions, any notes, anything anybody wants to say, speak now or forever hold your
Peas. 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 I'm holding my peas. Peas. Ooh, it's time for lunch. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I did do this previously in this in that hour of code to answer Amr's question in that hour of code live stream. But uh, what M what what the ML5 library didn't have was the ability to access the key points by their name. It's such an easier way, entry point into doing this that hopefully this tutorial is a little bit better. Will I ever do slam? I mean, not anytime soon, but uh, it's definitely something that interests me. So someday maybe? Can you start streaming a half an hour earlier, please? I'm not so sure. It depends on my schedule tomorrow. It's, it's the morning for me, so I need time to get in and get set up. But uh, maybe. Will you make a deep learning tutorial, asked Code Bolton. So I would say that, I, I mean, uh, far be it for me to know exactly what it is that I'm doing, but I would say that I have a lot of videos that touch on deep learning concepts. Um, all throughout the channel. They're a little tricky to find, but uh, see what you can find and um, feel free to reach out on Twitter or otherwise if you're, if you're struggling to find what you're looking for. <laughs> Simon's asking about generator functions. I have a long list of things to get to and it's, um, I just have to try to prioritize and do what I can the best that I can. Mickey posted that, can you use the cam thing to control a game like the Kinect? So yes, this PoseNet is very similar in terms of its tracking abilities to what the Microsoft Kinect product does. What's very different is that's a depth sensor that has a lot more information about the scene. So it's able to do probably, I would guess, more accurate tracking. And uh, in particular, it gives you uh, depth uh, information as well. How about making a sign language gesture classifier using a low res stream of PoseNet coordinates? That's a terrific job idea, and I'll, I'll point you to um, Abhishek, uh, who created this um, project, making Amazon Alexa respond to sign language using AI. I'm not, I actually don't know if he used uh, PostNet for this. He might have actually um, just used transfer learning and images, but, um, it's a wonderful project that I would encourage you to check out related to what you're asking about. So um, why, why Min asks, what's the purpose of this live stream? I'm really conflicted about this because um, uh, why not just make short tutorials? So this is what I'm doing. My goal, if everything go, went well today, this post that tutorial, uh, when Mathieu works on it as it will be 15 minutes or less. Um, and I just, I, ideally I would record the edited stuff. I don't know, but people seem to enjoy seeing the longer versions in the live streams. It's not perfect, but that's what I'm doing right now. Uh, is YouTube your main job? It is not. My main job is working as a teacher at uh, here at ITB. Ah, I forgot what I, that was the other thing I wanted to mention. If you were in New York City, uh, the first ever ITP show in Brooklyn, is happening this Sunday and Monday. Uh, Sunday, December 15th, 2 to 6 p.m. Monday, December 16th, 4 to 8 p.m. The winter show of all, this is where I teach. Uh, this is my main job. And um, I will be doing a live stream either Sunday or Monday. Probably Monday, but maybe Sunday uh, from the winter show. I'm using ML5 Feature Extractor Helper to load and train mobile net model with my own data set. How can I save the training data in this case? Ask Bashir. Ah, that's a good question. I don't think ML5 has any built-in functions to save your training data. It definitely has a function to save the model. Um, so if you want to save the training data, you might have to do something custom for that. That's the, I, I have to think about that more. But you, you can certainly save all the images, or you could, you could pull out the features and save the features. I don't know. That would be a great discussion on the ML5 uh, non-existent forum, but I guess on the GitHub for right now.
All right, everyone. I appreciate you. Um, I will be back tomorrow against my better judgment, but I do want to finish this project. Um, hope I, hopefully tomorrow will just be two hours because I have a lot to do and take care of with the show coming up. And I had to do a live stream from the show and the processing fundraiser. Ah, in addition to the holiday songs. So I mentioned the holiday song thing, but probably more importantly is you know, now I'm on my third or fourth year doing this. One year I did like snowflakes. I don't remember what I did. The oh, the other one year I did trees, like for, you know, your standard holiday thing that has a tree involved with it. Um, so what could I do this time for as like a winter themed bunch of like coding stuff? Please suggest it uh, in rainbow topics. And then what we can do is create a label um, like, why don't I make a label right now? There's the holiday telethon label already. Um, I guess we can just use the same one. Let's just use the same, let's use the same label. So please suggest them and I'll, we'll try to like upvote. You can also upvote thing, upvote um, them by, um, oh wow, there's a lot here. Okay, I'll take a look at these. Ooh, Northern Lights using Pro Noise. So I'm gonna do some coding topics during the holiday live stream. Uh, please suggest them here. Not uh, here, okay. I did snowflakes both years. <laughs> Nathan, yeah, if you can make it to New York City, Brooklyn, you can run audio for the live stream. Chaos equations, I think I've done those. Okay, ah, procedurally generated machine learning snow people. Ooh, okay. style get. Ooh, maybe I could do train a runway model off something wintry themed. I'm definitely gonna do that. Okay, goodbye everybody. Um, see you next time on the coding train. Mwah. I'm still here, by the way. <laughs> but I'm gonna mute my mic now. See you next time.